this court stuff. I've got a, I've got a friend of mine who is going through court, and he ran over. He was a he's a truck driver, and he ran over a bicycle guy who was holding on to his truck because he didn't want to undo his feet because they got like snaps that they do on their pedals, and he didn't want to undo his feet, and so the truck ran him over when he went over. And this guy is trying to sue the truck driver. Won't take responsibility for it. Nobody wants to take responsibility for what they did. And see, God says, if you wrong someone, compensation must be paid to them. And, look at this, 20%. So like, for instance, if you steal your neighbor's sheep, you have to give them their sheep back. Actually, I think that you have to pay five times every one you steal. But you have to give them 20% more. I mean, what would this nation be like if we required this? And the offering must be offered up to God. The high priest's sins are imputed to the congregation. The high priest was held extremely accountable. If he had sins then they were on the entire congregation. And most intentional sins required death. They took you out and stoned you. Can we go on, Lise? What number are you on? You got it? Okay. Sin must we be dealt with or you will die. That's what we don't know. Sin must be dealt with or you will die. That's what I kept hearing all week. Sin must, okay. Sin must we be dealt with or you will die. That's what we don't know. Sin must be dealt with or you will die. That's what I kept hearing all week. Sin must be dealt with or you will die. God is a holy God. Don't just think he's your best friend and he's going to let you just come back in. You must overcome sin or you will die. Look what it says in Romans 8.10. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. Yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, we have, no, we have an obligation not to live according to the sinful nature. Look at what it says. But if you live... According to the sinful nature, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, and, of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? We had that one before, but look what it says in verse 25 and all. Thanks to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. This is how you deal with sin. There's, there's steps to it. The first thing is confession. Confession means this involves confessing the specific area that was violated. Numbers 5, 6, 3, 7, it says, When a man or a woman commits any of the sins of mankind, acting unfaithfully against the Lord, and that person is guilty, then he shall confess his sins which he has committed. 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, the word confession is homologio, and it means to acknowledge your offense. It requires sorrow for offense and desire to accept responsibility and consequences for your actions. That's confession. 
Confession is not just going again. Lord, I'm sorry. And it's not going, ah, I'm sorry. That's not confession either. That's what confession is. It, it requires sorrow for your offense and desire to accept responsibility and consequences for your actions. The second step to biblical forgiveness from sin is the offender should research biblical violation, the one that he violated, and understand why it was wrong to commit the specific sin that he committed. See, the Bible is what we live our lives by. And when you find out that you've sinned, the best thing to do is to find it in the Word. The Holy Spirit will lead you to it. You find it in the Word, and you see what happened to the person. Research the repercussions that the sin caused the offender and the people as a whole in the nation. Remember, when we, when we studied Abimelech and Abraham, your sin doesn't just hurt you, it hurts others. Do you remember what happened with Abraham and Abimelech? You remember that this was one of those times also where he gave his wife, he said, tell him you're my sister. Even after Egypt, he did it again. And Abimelech takes her into his household and his whole, it was back then, it was very, very important to be able to have kids. And for a whole year, his tribe couldn't have kids because of this one thing. And he didn't even do anything wrong. God gave him a vision and said, if you touch her, you're a dead man. But for a whole entire year, he, he came to Abraham. Abraham was supposed to be God's man. His, his representative on the earth. That's the only one he's got during that time. So we know. And he comes, why did you do this to me? What, did I ever do anything to hurt you? Why did you do this to me? And Abraham lived in his land ashamed. Because he didn't represent God very well. It's hurt Sarah too. I mean, because imagine, you know, I'm just going to throw you away and save my hide. Imagine what that did to her and her self-esteem. The sins of the forefathers, we talk about them all the time. Numbers 14, they pass on. Not only are you sinning, but you are starting a pattern of, of sowing and reaping in your children's lives. That should scare you. It scares me. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 11, it says, I now rejoice now that you were made sorrowful. Not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. That's, that's the ticket right there. Sorrowful is no good without repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. And he goes on talking about, For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you, what vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal. See what it all, re all creates? What avenging of wrong. And everything you demonstrated yourself to be innocent in this matter. I mean, he, he accused them of something, and they were like, No, we didn't do that. But they were brought to repentance. But that's what it produces. It produces indignation and fear and longing and zeal. I want to avenge the wrong. That's what true repentance is. The word repentance is metanoia. And it means a strong uneasiness caused by a sense of guilt. This is what David is feeling. Including the desire to reform. He's like, I am so sorry for what I did. I'm so sorry. He can't undo what he did, but he can offer offerings. Repentance to salvation without regret. The word is soteria, and it means repentance to morally, physically deliver or rescue to safety versus the sorrow of the world that leads to death. See? Just being sorry you got caught is the sorrow that leads to death. I thought about this. Our justice system houses criminals and we pay for it. 
And they don't bring them any godly sorrow. And they don't make restitution. They're merely just